I continue today in the sermon series, Then and Now, and today I want to return to a sermon that um, in many of its manifestations I have brought back a couple of times through the years, but um, it was Christmas Eve in 2014 when a woman came up to me after everyone had exited. Um, it was Christmas morning by that point, and she had waited for everyone to go, and she came to me to tell me something she had carried for almost 10 years. She had come to church the Sunday I preached in the spring of 1994 on homosexuality in the Bible when I was at North Church. She had a plan that day to end her life by suicide, and she had the plan set with the time and everything, and she came to church before she did that. She said that sermon literally saved my life. Can you please preach it again? And I did, and now I preach it again. Before I begin today, I want to share this beautiful definition from the United Church of Christ Coalition of Open and Affirming Churches, LGBTQ+, it writes, it says on the website, is shorthand for lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, and queer or questioning. The word queer has often been adopted by people who don't want to be constrained by the identities of lesbian, gay, bisexual, or transgender. And the plus symbol reflects the diversity of sexual and gender identities in the whole human family. Thanks be to God for the United Church of Christ and for the 1,800 plus open and affirming congregations in our denomination and the 350,000 men and women who are part of these churches. Would you join me in prayer? May the words of my mouth and the meditations of each one of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our rock and our salvation. Amen. In my ministry, I have been blessed to be the pastor of two United Church congregations who were going through the process of becoming open and affirming and then made the decision to do so. In 1995, North Congregational UCC became the 194th out of 1,800 churches to be O&A. And then here at First Church in 2002, we became the 451st church of 1,800. Our two Columbus congregations were the first congregations south of the greater Cleveland metro area in Ohio to be open and affirming. North Congregational became the sixth Ohio congregation out of the 450 in the denomination here in Ohio at the time. And I'm deeply grateful to all of you and to my congregation from before for having been honored to pastor two open and affirming churches, the last 29 years of my life. Through all of this growth, the one thing I have heard consistently as a pushback from moderate and conservative Christians goes something like this. The Bible says homosexuality is a sin, and we can't go against the Bible. So I wish to address this and those who have retreated into the Alamo of prejudice by declaring the Bible says homosexuality is a sin and we can't go against the Bible. If, you could, if I could, I'd love to wave a wand <laughs> over the world most of the time, but I'd love to wave a wand and say, this is the last time I'll ever say anything about this because we'll figure it out now. But I don't have a wand, so let's just jump in. So here we go. What does the Bible say? about homosexuality. This may surprise many of you, but the Bible doesn't have much to say about homosexuality. It appears the Bible really isn't interested in the topic, and so I'll go sit down. <laughs> Wait, you would be too happy to see that happen, so she said. <laughs> I'll make you suffer a little longer. It appears the Bible isn't interested in this. The original texts of Hebrew and Greek and Syrian and Aramaic don't have a word 
homosexuality. It's not a word that they ever used because it wasn't something that was operational in their scheme of thinking or living. The word doesn't even appear in any Bible until it appears in 1946 in the Revised Standard Version of the Bible. And depending on your Bible of choice, and many conservative Christians will pick the New King James Version because homosexuality appears there, you may not even see the word in a Bible or any of its cognates. There are seven primary passages of scripture, four in the Jewish scriptures, Genesis 19, which you heard Saturn read, uh, Leviticus 18, 22, and 20, 13, and Deuteronomy 23, 17 to 18. I hope you don't try to write those down in a hurry. And then three in the Christian scriptures, Romans 1, 18 to 32, 1 Corinthians 6, 1 through 8, and 1 Timothy 1, 9 and 10 verses. That most often, these are the passages rolled out in arguments against homosexuality. These texts speak against same-sex acts in some way, and each, though, is related more to adultery, promiscuity, violence, and idolatrous worship, and in fact will find hospitality than anything else. So before studying these, I just need to say, that if you add the words of these seven passages up, they could fit on about half a page of an 1,100-page Bible, thus making less than one-tenth of one percent of Holy Scripture that God has given us. Do you know what the first two topics are in the Bible that appear over and over and over again in thousands of passages? You probably do. The first is care for the poor, and the second is stewardship of the earth and care for one another with the stewardship of gifts God has given us. So I ask, before I begin on the other seven texts with a few words in them, wouldn't it be great if we could all get together in the billions of Christians that exist and work on those two things, we would save the earth and we would care for the poor and solve poverty all at once. I'm just saying, here we go. Genesis 19, the story of Sodom and Gomorrah. So in Genesis 18, 16 to 33, God has sent two angels to the city of Sodom to find 10 righteous people. You, if you know this story, God's going back and forth with Abraham. Abraham, he says a thousand, and Abraham says, no, not a thousand. So they go back and forth, they come up with 10. If God can find 10 righteous people, the city will be spared. When the angels arrive, Abraham's brother Lot befriends them and brings them to his home. Later that night, Lot's house is surrounded by all the men of Sodom, old and young, who demand that Lot brings the visitors out so that they might know them. Those are quotation marks. Lot pleads with the crowd on behalf of the angels and then, catch this, offers the crowd his two virgin daughters, suggesting that the crowd would rather know them. Okay, so the whole question of knowing things is, a, a, is at play here, but I just need to say, that man is a horrible father. I just need to put that out there. Lot should not be allowed to be a father. Those daughters should be taken away from him. Anyway, as we just heard Saturn and read it, the passions cries out to us. Did you just read that Lot offered his virgin daughters to these men who intend to do harm? <sighs> This is sick. Let's proceed. Without actually studying the passage, I'm going to say that again, without actually studying the passage, too many Christians assume that the sin of Sodom, for which the city is later wiped out, is homosexuality. This assumption is based completely on the belief that to know is a euphemism for sexual intercourse. Although to know does refer to sexual intercourse, which by the way, there's two interpretations in the same passage. The first one is not about that. The second one is about the daughters. Although to know does refer to sexual intercourse in 10 passages of the Bible, it's not in this one. In addition, it appears in 933 passages of the Bible and it has no sexual connotations. It means to have knowledge of or acquaintance with. It has nothing to do with knowing another person sexually. If this is so, then the sin of Sodom is not male-to-male -male intercourse, it is inhospitality. 
Pay attention now, because the Old Testament prophets, Jesus, Peter, and Jude, agree with me. Now, I really like it when that lineup agrees with me. Not with Franklin Graham, not with Rod Parsley, not with any local or national pastor who uses this passage to bash LGBTQ plus people. Sodom's sin is not homosexual rape. Isaiah 1, 10, Isaiah 3, 9, Jeremiah 23, 14, and Ezekiel 16, 49 all say that God was angry at Sodom because the people were proud and prosperous and they refused to help the poor and needy. Whether you like it or not, God had decided to wipe out Sodom long before this interaction outside of Lot's house. In the New Testament, Peter and Jude mention Sodom, but in general reference to what happens when people live ungodly lives. Paul never talks about Sodom, and as we come to Paul a little later, you'll know if this was important to him, he would have said something, right? And in Matthew 10, 15, Jesus says that if a town refuses you as disciples to be hospitable to you, shake off the dust and move on. The story of Sodom is really about wickedness. It's about self-centered people who refuse to help those in need, who refuse to care for the strangers at their gates. God was angry because people behaved badly, not because they were gay. Let me say that again. God is angry because people behave badly, not because they're gay. Is it any wonder? Nevertheless, to this day, we still refer to civil laws as sodomy laws, right? And we also talk about certain acts as sodomizing, even though these laws have nothing to do with hospitality, just as Sodom has nothing to do with homosexuality. So we've got to change the language we use if we're going to get through this time. We have to stop misusing words and creating that create more prejudice. In the three laws of Leviticus and Deuteronomy, the, the question of male-to-male -male sexuality is condemned. But it is crucial to note that the real concern in each of these three laws is about impurity. It's about wasting the seed of life. And it stands in direct reaction to pagan and Canaanite practices. We cannot mistake reading these texts anymore. The laws exact a punishment on offenders in Leviticus 20, such as those that will be condemned to death for this. Now, my question is, to anyone who is a scholar, has anyone in Judaism ever been killed for wasting their seed? No, that's the answer. The answer is no. No one. In 5,784 years of the history of this faith, no one has been put to death for this. We need to remember something about the 613 laws found in Leviticus and Deuteronomy. These laws make no distinction, distinction between moral laws and ceremonial laws. So how, if you make no distinction between those laws, how would you choose to enforce which law is greater than another? Again, it's only prejudice against people that raises the question of how they're going to exact the punishment, right? For example, if we follow these laws and put people to death for homosexual acts or homogenital acts, will we also follow the Levitical law which says we should stone our children to death for disobedience? Please don't say yes. The answer is no to that one, okay? Will we demand that all husbands and wives abstain from sexual contact except during fertile periods? Or be put to death? Anyway, I'll keep going. Should we look at the harvest of the fields? It says very clearly you harvest to the edge of the field to feed the poor. If that doesn't happen, should we put people to death for that? If you want to enforce one of these, you enforce all of these. And this is preposterous. If you don't believe me, call a rabbi. Second, Jesus said he came to fulfill the laws, not to destroy them. Did not Jesus' fulfillment of the law focus on two laws? Let's go back to this. To love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength. 
and to love your neighbor as yourself. How then does any Christian have an ounce of integrity focusing on Jewish laws about homogenital acts when Jesus has clarified this question for all of us for the last 2,000 years, saying the law that we follow is the law of loving our neighbor. Are you with me? Speaking of Jesus, let's look at the New Testament. Jesus says absolutely, this is not a black O. He says absolutely nothing, nothing about this. Nothing, not a nix, zero. While he addresses stewardship and poverty and care for the poor and healing, right living in relationships with neighbors of any kind and number, he never breathes a mumbling word about sexual relations. Why is he silent? Well, either same-sex issues were not important to Jesus, or he just simply chose not to go there, or both, or perhaps, perhaps, and this is what I'm going with, Jesus was the first open and affirming Christian. Let's go with that. Maybe Jesus actually did mean it when he said, I love everyone. Maybe that's what he was going for. Now, Paul was not so quiet. While he didn't mention Sodom, which is actually good that he didn't do that, he did talk about male-to-male -male sex. In his landmark book, 1983, The New Testament and Homosexuality, Union Theological Seminary professor Robin Scroggs offers the position that Paul was speaking not against male-to-male -male sex per se, but against pederasty, which literally means men having sex with boys or young teens. And pederasty was an open and common practice in many Hellenistic cities in Paul's time where he was going to preach. This was a form of abuse. It was a form of rape. It was not mutual love. It was not love at all. I would hope that all of us would join Paul in opposing such abusive use of power and sex. Scroggs continues, what the New Testament was against was the image of homosexual, was not the image of homosexuality, but the image of homosexuality as pederasty, and primarily here in its more sordid and dehumanizing dimensions. In the good book, Peter Gomes writes this, Paul is not writing about homosexuality in Romans. He is writing about the fallen nature of humankind. You see, Paul's concern that passions that lead to emotions out of control are what is, matters the most. Dishonorable passions dishonor God. So the shameful acts that Paul brings into focus here of lust and avarice and exploitation and power and abuse, these are the worst qualities of humankind, not qualities to be associated in any way specifically with somebody who is gay. That is absurd if you do that. It's absolutely absurd and has no place in the 21st century. I hope and pray that when each of you consider a loving relationship, Whatever the orientation of your relationship is, you always do so with a heart of love and mutuality and gentleness. With any other heart, you'll find yourself in trouble with the Apostle Paul, certainly, <laughs> and certainly with God as well. Well, I have not fully addressed Paul's writings. I hope I have opened a door to understanding in our great, uh, what our greatest evangelist was writing about. So I like what Scroggs says in the conclusion to his book, this was written 41 years ago. That's a long time ago. Biblical judgments against homosexuality are not relevant in today's debate. 1983. They no longer can be used in denominational discussions about homosexuality and should in no way be a weapon to justify refusal of ordination, not because the Bible is not authoritative, but simply because the Bible does not address the issues involved. Drop the mic, right? Today after the service, and I, I, I won't go too far off the script here, somebody came up to me and his father is in, he's in the Christian Reformed Church. His father has served for 40 years and they're now coming up with a truth statement that all the pastors have to sign against gay people. And so they're setting pastor against pastor, church against church, much like the Methodist church has gone through. This stuff is sick. 
it needs to stop. That powerful conclusion that Scruggs came to was reached as well by conservative theologian John Stott in an article of Billy Graham's magazine, Christianity Today, 31 years ago. Stott told readers in 1993, stop using biblical text to prop up your arguments against persons who are homosexual. The case cannot be made, it is time to stop. 31 years ago. William Sloan Coffin, who is not conservative, put it this way, the problem is not how to reconcile homosexuality with scriptural passages that appear to condemn it, but rather how to reconcile the rejection and punishment of gay people with the love of Jesus Christ. It cannot be done. I have preached this for a long, long time. But I say to you now, I said in 1994, the Bible is not interested in homosexuality. So, where does the fascination with using the Bible to beat people up, literally abuse them, to use a gospel gun to shoot down LGBTQ plus people? Where does that come from? I believe it comes from lots of sources, but I believe it comes from people who haven't dealt with their own sexuality and their own understanding of who they are and are trying to hide something. They're trying to weaponize their personal issues in ways that hurt other people. There's a lot more to it than that, but that's what I've seen. This issue isn't God's problem, it's our problem. If we have washed away this struggle, like the ocean washes away the sands of time, then where does that leave us today? Well, it brings us back to the only thing that matters, what Jesus said so long ago, that our reason for living and serving God is this, to love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength, and to love your neighbor as yourself. That's it. As such, we must fight against unjust laws that harm our LGBTQ plus children and youth and our neighbors. And I wanna point out, in the last legislative session down the street, that way, they passed laws against transgender youth competing in sports and getting medical care. And you know how many transgender youth, I've heard from a Republican um, associate, they were talking about it was six to 10 kids in the state of Ohio. In the meantime, we still have to deal with the real issues of our time. I wrote about it this week in the paper, poverty, where over a million people don't have a place to call home and, um, and are hungry today. That seems to me to be not only the focus for our Christian lives, but also for our social life as well. So as, as we fight this, we have to protect our neighbors. It means we have to establish laws and safety nets for our neighbors of all generations who've been harmed by injustice surrounded by gay bashing and hate. And as the church, especially, we need to open our hearts and arms to all who have been injured and harmed by hate because of their orientation or gender identity. For all who are here today and all who are listening somewhere out there, I just wanna say I'm deeply, deeply sorry for the way that any of you have been hurt or family members have been hurt by the church through 2,000 years of this mistake. I'm deeply sorry and pained by that. I'm sorry for the way that you have been outed or the way that you have been silenced or the way that you have not been able to come out because of the church. I'm sorry for all that hurt. In my love for you and on behalf of all of us here at First Church, I offer that and I say, come home to us. Be, let us be together and grow together as people of faith and stand um, on the promises of God. Speaking of standing, I'd like for you all to end this with standing. Let's turn to the back of our bulletins today and end by reading our open and affirming statement which has been in our Sunday Bulletin every year for almost 22 years. If you could stand and read this together. It starts with the words, we 
and I would say members and friends, not just members, but we, the members of First Congregational Church, United Church of Christ, Columbus, Ohio, welcome and affirm all. We believe we are all created in God's image and are called to love our neighbors as Jesus loves us. We believe we are many members, but one body in Christ, called to unite all people in God's love. We are a community seeking God's presence and love in our lives. We seek to unite persons of all ages, races, nationalities, ethnicities, sexual orientations, sexes, gender identities and expressions, family structures, mental, intellectual, and physical conditions, economic circumstances, political, theology, and faith backgrounds. Together in our diversity and being empowered and directed by the Holy Spirit, we will do justice, love kindness, and walk humbly with our God. Amen. Thank you.